I would like to welcome Paul Vixie. Yay! <laughs> Paul is presenting Going Dark, Catastrophic Security and Privacy Losses Due to the Loss of Visibility by Managed Private Networks. Paul first took the Nanog stage in 1994. Since then, he's spoken 25 times, most recently as a keynote in 2019. Was it really that long ago? Wow, that was in San Francisco. Uh, currently VPDE at AWS Security, Paul has founded, co-founded, authored, or co-authored many of the industry practices we use today. Paul is also a well-known collector of 10 millimeter wrenches. He can explain that. And uh, likes to drive a standard. Mr. Vixie, or sorry, Dr. Vixie. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Hello, good morning. Um, I'm really fascinated by some of the things Harlan just exposed. Uh, I met him through the NTP project, and it turns out a lot of the pile of patches that uh, Dr. Mills asked him to apply were from me. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, so today, uh, going to talk a little bit about QUIC, Q-U-I-C, a little bit about DNS over HTTPS. Um, and this is kind of more of an edge problem or an edge opportunity. It's an edge topic rather than a core topic. And I realize a lot of you are just sort of in the packet business and don't necessarily care where they're coming from or where they're going or whether they're good or evil. Um, but I do, and uh, even if you don't in your day job, you probably do at your house. So, uh, you know, please uh, be, uh, be willing to consider some security implications uh, because not all packets are uh, morally equal. Um, so, uh, I do want to say, I, although I am uh, wearing the shirt and I am an Amazon employee, uh, they did not send me here to do this. Uh, as far as I know, none of this would be considered controversial by anybody at Amazon, but they're definitely my views. Uh, so uh, please keep that in mind as you go through this. Uh, there is really no effective modern site security. Um, and uh, I'll get into the reasons for that, but uh, that is sort of something that's got to be understood as you contemplate what's going on in the standards world. Um, so uh, we don't use, there's no useful way to look for patterns and say, oh, look, it's uh, the, this particular bit pattern is part of a known botnet or is part of a known signature um, because everything is encrypted now. Um, so we don't have the ability to say these patterns are bad and we're going to stop them. What we do instead is we look at what the endpoints are doing uh, and we try to build a, a model, a, a norm of some kind, and um, when they fall outside that norm, when they go outside that norm, then you, you say, hey, that's an anomaly. And I don't know why. It could be just a new, new version of the software, but let's go take a look at it. And uh, this is lame. This is not what one would think of if you uh, sort of were building this uh, on, on an empty whiteboard and, and trying to sort of figure out how you really wanted it to work in order to maximize safety, minimize costs. Um, but it's what we have. And uh, we are, roughly speaking, forced to it. Um, and alternatives are way more expensive. So... Um, I want to remind us all that uh, it's a global internet, and we, are, we now have an attack surface that includes every powered device in the world. And uh, even if certain physical assets in the world are, you know, they're physical, they, they aren't really network uh, accessible as physical objects, but they, the record of their ownership and the ability to control them or monitor them absolutely is. And so um, everything of value uh, in the world is connected and uh, we don't have a way to secure it. And um, you know, if you read the headlines and you're wondering how did it get so bad, that's it. Um, yeah, so again, uh, don't panic. This is stuff you already know, um, 
But you've got to keep this in mind, again, while you evaluate what's happening in the standards committee right, or community right now. So there are really no experts anymore. Um, and, you know, I come from a time when a uh, small number of people, small number of big, expensive mini computers, it was generally possible to know what was going on. Uh, and to keep track of the research that affected what was going on. You know, I remember uh, early days of BSD, somebody discovered, hey, if you send a Christmas tree packet, a TCP SYN with all the option bits set, you can crash any BSD kernel that you can reach. Um, but, you know, we, there were so few of us and so few BSD uh, computers that it was fixed in a week. Uh, we're not going to do that anymore, not just because there are too many things to patch, but uh, because the vendors are, don't exist anymore for a lot of our stuff. Um, if they do, it's very possible that our particular product from, a, from some vendor is no longer reproducible. Uh, they don't necessarily have the build system that it would take to patch a thing so that they can send you an update, and it may be that they don't know who you are and can't send you the update, um, there's, a, there's a whole lot of reasons that um, you, it's just too big. There's no way to be an expert relative to the size of what we must maintain and operate and, and secure. Um, <clears throat> and you know what that in turn means is that if you have some estimate of your safety, you're wondering how bad is it, uh, how exposed am I, uh, that is a wave function at this point. All you have is probability. Uh, you don't have certainty. And that puts a confidence interval around every statement of confidence that we have in our current safety. Um, again, this is lame. This is not how you would build this if you had a choice. What we had was not a choice, but rather a series of choices stretch, stretching back about 30 years. Uh, and each thing that we did was the next thing that could be done, and in many cases, the best that could be done at that time. And uh, by now, we have gone a long way down a trail and we can only go forward. <clears throat> so, you know, uh, backups, you know, whenever somebody reports that they have uh, had to pay a ransom to get their data back or get the decryption key, you know, backups is my first question. Did you have backups? And, you know, backups is a reasonable strategy if you are um, uh, talking about your own laptop. But when it's, let's say, Sony and North Korea has uh, done the bad thing, it's difficult to imagine how Sony could have had backups for everything that they lost. Um, and the same would be true of uh, pretty much everything else that you have to do is it's too expensive to do well. Right. The reason that uh, cloud companies like the shirt here uh, do well is that they can afford to make the necessary investments to do these things well. And uh, everybody else, not everybody, but a lot of other companies would rather sort of buy into a mature supply chain that solves these problems well than to have to hire usually difficult people uh, the, to come and uh, create and operate all of that infrastructure locally. Um, and again, that's why Splunk does well in the logging market. That's why all the various security companies do so well is because they are doing things that need to be done in a way that the end users cannot afford to do for themselves. Uh, again, this is maybe not as lame as uh, the other examples I've given, but it is not what you would think of. If, you know, if any of these companies had a chance to choose their operating environment, they probably wouldn't have chosen to need as many outside suppliers as everyone now needs. Uh, and, you know, sadly, the outside suppliers become a single point of failure for many, uh, either because they, uh, sometimes your supply chain gets breached, uh, sometimes your supply chain, you know, has an earthquake or something like that. So uh, external dependencies are things you would like to have a choice about and you don't in, this, in these cases. And finally, you know, the way that site security uh, became so ineffective is just, it comes down to the incentives. 
an attacker will uh, make money if they win, and a uh, defender will spend money whether they win or whether they lose. So if it's a profit center for one side of the equation and a cost center for the other, then you can begin to understand uh, why the attackers are so good. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, let me just hope that what I've done is paint a picture of um, very expensive, very dangerous operating conditions for the world's assets, uh, all of which are either uh, connected to the Internet or are controlled by things that are connected by the, uh, to the Internet. <clears throat> So in 2013, a uh, contractor uh, famously flew to Hong Kong and uh, made some disclosures and said, by the way, this is what the U.S. government has been up to. Um, you know, did you know there was a, a secret lab where a uh, router could be redirected out of the Federal Ex Express shipping lanes and uh, have chips added to it on its way to some destination that the U.S. government wanted to be able to surveil. Uh, that would be one of many disclosures. It was a big deal. It was like the big st the story of 2013. And, um, you know, it's no secret that governments, not just the U.S. government, but governments through history, um, use dirty tricks. Um, and the idea of, you know, whether it's right or wrong is fun to argue about if you have a beer in your hand, but uh, the people who are doing it are not going to have those arguments. It's all about power, and it's all about duty, and uh, doing whatever it is that you, you those folks think is their duty. Um, so I was part of a group of people who was not especially shocked by these disclosures. Yeah, some of the details were eyebrow raising, but the idea that, yeah, the U.S. government is uh, is committing dirty tricks, yeah, uh, that's that's what governments do, but a lot of other people um, got out, got up. They set their hair on fire. They said, you know, oh my goodness, this is a terrible state of affairs. Governments should not be able to act this way. And um, after some years of debate, we got a couple of RFCs. Uh, 7258 uh, simply explained to the standards com community that pervasive monitoring is an attack, and uh, that all of the technology that we will build in the future has to be resistant to that attack. Uh, later, uh, something that I consider even more controversial is um, that 8890 said that the internet is for end users. Um, now you can perform the same test I did. You know, check the back of your skull, check all over your entire head and see if you have a Cat5 jack. Because if you don't, um, the internet is not for end users. The internet is for the makers of the devices that the end users are using. Um, so this thing is a uh, dangerous statement because what we're saying is um, give away your control to corporate persons uh, and the internet is for them. And uh, that indeed is what you're seeing. I am a member of the advisory board at the uh, Electronic Privacy Information Center, epic.org, um, and the chairman of the fiduciary board is uh, the incoming is Shoshana Zubkoff, who wrote a great book I recommend it. It's The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. Um, and so I am uh, very worried about a lot of different things, and some of my worries conflict with others of my worries. Right. Uh, if um, if children are being hurt online, uh, sexual predation, uh, grooming, whatever, um, we'd like to be able to protect them. Uh, but we need to do that without uh, annihilating privacy. So we have to find a way to both have and not have privacy simultaneously. That's a very interesting problem. Um, these are not interesting solutions to that problem. These are uh, single-minded, cartoonish attempts to pretend that problem is not important. Uh, so, not a fan. Um, in particular, the, uh, the idea of pervasive monitoring being an attack uh, means that if you have a firewall and you'd like to inspect the traffic coming in and out of your edge network, you are part of the problem, according to RFC 7258. 
uh, endpoints should be allowed to speak to other endpoints and nobody in the middle should be able to see what's going on or decide whether it's uh, safe or not. Um, and indeed, the, the, I, the IETF is taking this seriously. Uh, if you want to debate it, you'll find that uh, there is no room for debate at this point. Uh, the debate was had, and it was had in light of everybody setting their hair on fire in 2013. So I think there will be a, a backlash uh, to, uh, against this at some point, but right now we're going there. Um, and, you know, I, I want to note that uh, the way we're doing this now is that malware has rights because, if, you know, software that the maker of your device did not intend to include, but their supply chain was poisoned, uh, or if it's just vulnerable and uh, some malware gets into it because it tries to do some internet thing and then there's this extra payload or buffer overrun or whatever, uh, you can end up with a device on your network and, you know, fairly often this will be a, a IoT refrigerator or something like that, uh, that is under the control of not you, the homeowner, and not whoever it is that sold it to you, but some other party, which could easily be uh, some government, uh, which means that we did not solve the problem that uh, was described in 2013. Um, this is chilling, uh, and it's happening in plain sight, and we're even paying for the devices that, that do this. Um, so, because the internet is for end users, uh, malware qualifies as an end user. Uh, go us. Now, the internet, uh, again, as I said earlier, was not planned. We didn't have an empty whiteboard and uh, say, yeah, we want a global e-commerce platform that, uh, to which everything will be connected. Um, I'm sure that was uh, in in mind as a lovely outcome, because the alternative was the OSI protocol suite. Um, but really, all the whiteboard is going to contain is a solution to the problems that you have at that moment, or the opportunities that you're seeking at that moment. Um, and that sort of incrementalism is quite chaotic, uh, quite unpredictable, um, and, you know, the, the only truly good thing about it is that there's no other way we could have an internet than to do it that way. If we had known how much had to be built back in the days when transistors cost a dollar a piece, we would have given up and said that what we want to do can't be done. Instead, you know, we built the routers we could build and we had classful uh, addressing and, you know, flat text files for naming and, you know, we gradually improved each thing within the context of everything else that by then existed. And um, yeah, that was the only way we could have got here. So uh, chaos is a harsh mistress. Uh, you you got to have it and then you got to live with it. But what this in turn meant was that a lot of the protocols that we depend on uh, don't account for things like firewalls uh, or network address translation or uh, any other uh, sort of reasonable security policy enforcement, right? The protocols just do what they do. And it was up to us to find a way to kind of deal with the simplicity of the system without violating any of the, uh, the, the, the assumptions that made it work at all. Um, and I think that was great. I mean, it's kind of ugly. Nobody would, would have designed NAT into this in the first place, but the fact that it was able to be added was a huge validation of the approach that had been taken uh, for IP and TCP in the first place. So uh, again, uh, go us. But um, we do have a bit of a mess, and this feeds back into the fact that nobody can, you know, there isn't expertise. Uh, some of us know a lot about a few things, some of us know a little about, about a lot of things. Nobody knows everything, and nobody knows, and we do not collectively know enough. The complexity of that which we are trying to understand is growing, uh, and you know you, you could even think of it as like the expanding universe, right? The, uh, we are lucky to see uh, galaxies in the sky, but they're receding at more than the speed of light, and so a billion years from now, our sky will be dark because the universe is expanding. Well, think of this as that same thing. 
the universe of our technical operating conditions is expanding. Uh, and it's doing that exponentially. So to secure any of this, uh, as I mentioned, you've got to find a way to uh, impose yourself on what's happening in a way that breaks only the things you intend to break, right? If you say, I'm going to be secure because I have these wire cutters, uh, that will not be a popular move, and it'll put you out of business. Um, but if you can say, well, I'm going to block traffic that I know to be bad um, and then allow the rest, I mean, that's dangerous, but it's practical. You can do it. Uh, you could do the opposite. Uh, you could say, I'm going to allow the traffic that I know to be good and deny the rest. And that is a less dangerous, but also sort of higher cost uh, alternative, because it'll mean that, you know, some new protocol will come along like SCTP, and because nothing new to allow it, uh, it's default deny, and you can't actually deploy it outside of very specialized networks. Um, so the thing that you can't do uh, in this new world uh, is any of that. You can't decide what to allow or deny because you don't know what it is. And this is not just for operating system kernels and uh, host-based firewalls. It's also the site security administrator uh, or an authoritarian government. Um, there are, if, if you travel in certain parts of the world, you'll find that you can't reach certain parts of the internet, and that's because the government wants it that way. And that's because they can tell where you're trying to go, and if they don't want you to go there, or they don't want anybody in the country to go there, then they can insist. Um, now, if you are one of the people who set your hair on fire in 2013, and you are a legitimate, passionate defender of human freedom, um, you're going to look at this and say, uh, whatever comes next can't be more of this. We, we need to sort of uh, flip, the, flip the game. We need to flip the board and get a very different uh, set of operating conditions. And that in turn means encrypt everything. Um, now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to tell you very much about... Uh, entropy, but I do want to say information entropy is a little different from heat entropy, and it has to do with the ratio of uh, microstates that could have produced a macrostate, uh, and, you know, if, you, if there are more of them, then you have uh, the higher entropy, and the idea of all of this encryption is, uh, by God, encrypt it so hard that it is indistinguishable from anything else that you have encrypted. Um, and we have the ability to do that. Uh, now, there's some uh, arguments about how we do this in a quantum computing world, which all of us know is coming. Uh, so a lot of the current crypto that we have will be uh, weak in uh, you know, 15 years. Um, and there are people working on post-quantum crypto right now so that we can start using it so that by the time we have quantum computers, the crypto will be strong enough for them. Uh, that's one of the great games that I'm glad to see played, because uh, we do need crypto. So here's an RFC 8484 that uh, describes a protocol DNS over HTTPS. That uh, you know, I'm just I, I highlighted one passage here, uh, which is that the goal of this protocol is to prevent on-path devices from interfering with DNS operations. Well, guess what? That's what corporate firewalls do. That's what uh, parental filtering does. That is how people who own managed private networks decide to protect against certain kinds of attacks. Um, and since they own the network, it's a little odd to me that we now have a standard that says, yeah, it doesn't matter what you own. Uh, the endpoint has ultimate power, period. Um, and uh, that's happening. This is uh, becoming widely practiced. And, you know, to be fair, there are things that a managed private network wants to do that um, maybe public networks should not do, right? This whole thing about uh, I want to maybe protect my children against online predation by monitoring them or by preventing them from getting to certain websites. Um, you know, I'm a parent. I own the computer, it's my child, it's my house, I pay for the internet connection, I should be able to do that. 
But if it's an ISP who wants to monitor my children or the, the local government wants to monitor my children, then I think they are uh, trying to command something that is not theirs to command. And so uh, there are legitimate times when you should forbid the uh, on-path interference, uh, it, but there are times that you shouldn't, and that is not allowed for by any of these specifications. So now we have quick. Quick is coming right at you. It is RFC 9000, 9001, 9002. Um, it is a pretty decent bit of engineering. A lot of work went into it. Um, but this passage uh, causes me some heartache, um, partly because it's misleading, right? Because the, what it should have said is the quick wire image is specifically designed to be indistinguishable from other UDP traffic, because that's the truth. It was written in light of RFC 8890, and that's what it's said to do, and that's what we are doing, and that's why we're doing it. But I, I tried to get this changed, and I couldn't. I got some other language added around it, but uh, nobody wants to come right out and say that we intend this traffic to be indistinguishable, even though um, they, they very much do. Um, so, what does this mean? Uh, it means you're not going to see any of this anymore. So if you have a load balancer that is counting on understanding the window scale so it can figure out what to do with the flow, sorry, that's all encrypted in the quick, quick world. If you have a firewall that says, I wish to allow outbound TCP sessions from this edge network, uh, but not inbound, uh, you're not going to be able to do that either because there is no SYN or ACK bit that the router or the firewall can, can witness. Uh, the, only the endpoints know why this packet was transmitted. And um, if you're thinking you might be able to do this with flow accounting and say that uh, the first time this four tu five tuple tries to talk to that five tuple, then I can look at the directionality of that packet. No, you can't because the, uh, the session could be long suspended, could go hours without uh, communicating and then be uh, reused by either side. And so you can't really, you just can't do the types of policy that we have all been doing for our edge networks all these years. And we are not the targets of this. I want to say, unless you are an authoritarian government, um, you are not the, uh, the reason that this, uh, the, this protocol exists or uh, is being made or is about to be widely deployed. Uh, we are simply collateral damage in the fight against uh, governments doing what governments do. Let's talk a moment about uh, transport layer security. Uh, this is the name of the crypto suite that we use for pretty much everything. Uh, SSL is uh, kind of dead and, and uh, none too soon. TLS 1.2 is very broadly adopted. It's just about everywhere. And uh, it has a property that may have been accidental. It may be that nobody did this deliberately, but uh, when it was done, nobody thought it was a problem. Uh, but the, 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 the name of the server that you want to talk to on the far end uh, is in clear text. And so if you have a next-gen firewall that is uh, sort of being the man in the middle for some TCP session, and pretending to be the other end long enough that you'll tell it what the host name is that you want the other end to, to uh, act as, then um, that all works. And so those of us who have you know, big corporate networks to protect, maybe we've got regulators, maybe we've got uh, regulatory requirements, pol uh, policy imposed by government as to what traffic we must al allow or must deny, um, that works. You can do that. Um, but that's a problem, right? The reason this even exists is because the far end, uh, it may, ha may be a CDN of some kind. It may have millions or tens of millions of different websites it could behave as, all with the same three or four IP addresses that are TCP any casted and so forth, right? That shows the, uh, the amazing sort of agility of the original design to be able to sort of permit all of this to just kind of come about. And it didn't come about naturally. A lot of people had to think very hard to get this, but we got it. But um, 
the idea is you have to tell the other end what host it should be so that it will know what certificate to present you with. Uh, seems like a no-brainer. Um, TLS 1.3 has an option called encrypted client hello uh, where once you've got your initial encryption set up that is, and only that will allow you to send this client hello information that includes the server name. So this used to be called encrypted SNI, server name indicator, uh, but it got broadened to encrypt the, encrypting the entire client hello message. So any of our corporate firewalls that depend on, you know, let's say it's the law of, in your country that uh, people be able to reach their child's school or their bank or, you know, other critical infrastructure for families from the work uh, network. Um, and so you might have had an allow list that said, these are the banks and schools and things that, that have to be reachable from our employee desktops. Um, you can't do that anymore. So the law commands you to do it, but the protocol now commands that you don't. Um, that would be an example of uh, the cure being uh, a, a disease of its own. It's, you know, we're, we're deciding, whenever you innovate, you're saying, uh, I want different problems. I want different opportunities. I, I want to deal with the problems and opportunities that I have so that I will have better ones. And in this case, I don't think it's a better one. I think we have swapped the problem we had for a problem we're going to dislike equally, if not more. So uh, this is going to be a huge deal. And uh, what we're going to do about it is going to depend on our other costs. So you could say, look, um, the ocean is so large and my boat is so small I just have to let this happen. I just have to, you know, go to the new place and live in the new way and just deal with those costs. So, um, not good, but many organizations, many homes will just, uh, they have to do this. They don't have uh, any other choice. Those of us who do have other choices are going to do things that are very expensive. Um, for example, since I know that Quick relies on UDP, I'm glad that I have always treated UDP as a dangerous protocol and I have only allow listed certain UDP patterns. In particular, if you want to reach a DNS server, it better be the one on our, on our network or you had better be that DNS server trying to do some kind of server-to-server -server traffic off net. And other than that, UDP falls on the floor, which means quick simply won't work at my house. And that's a choice I can afford to make, but I'm, uh, and probably most of you in this room could afford to make that choice, uh, but we are what would be called one percenters in that regard. Most of the world won't be doing that. Um, something else we might do, in particular in the example I gave you about uh, if your nation's laws require that your employees be able to use the corporate network to reach their bank during their lunch hour or whatever, uh, you may have to say, uh, I'm not going to allow end-to-end -end connectivity. Even though that's better for any number of reasons, I can't afford to do it anymore. The risks are too great. So I'm going to put a proxy there, an ALG, uh, and you're going to have to configure your device to talk to and trust some kind of proxy, and uh, it, you, you will exchange certificate inf information with it. It will uh, look at everything you intend to do in clear text, and uh, regenerate your session toward the outside. Right? There are plenty of networks that already work this way. But the problem is, in some countries, you're not allowed to then look at the banking traffic that you're required to permit. So it's going to be very interesting to see how we solve the, uh, the, the PCI issues that are going to come about from all of this, because you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Um, go us. So. Um, these are expensive choices and they're being imposed for political reasons. Um, they're also uh, unstoppable. And I am not telling you what might happen. <clears throat> I'm telling you what is inevitable, what's already in progress. There is considerable energy uh, powering this, this change. Um, in addition to sort of the PCI problems, there's also just uh, the bad engineering, right? We don't like state inside of our networks. And it's okay if it's opportunistic, right? If your 
uh, fib has to periodically fetch something from the rib because a new flow is starting up and the line card doesn't know what to do with it. And that's state, but it's opportunistic, right? If you didn't have it, everything would just go slow, but it would still work. Um, we're not talking about that. We're talking about state that must exist in order to fulfill the policy objectives of edge network owners, secure private networks that you're supposed to have autonomy over. So um, in addition to the problem of calling somebody and saying, would you please stop DDoSing me? And the person you call says, I have no idea which one of my hosts is DDoSing you or what they're infected with. I have no insight at all into what's going on on my network or the devices on my network. So uh, you're just going to get what you get. That's a big change because it used to be we called them autonomous systems because the, the, there was somebody who owned something. And they were responsible for what it did and they could make choices uh, and they were responsible for those choices. That era is ending. But the other problem is we're going to have these uh, sort of weird devices at the edges of networks that keep track of the state of every transaction that goes through it. And that's additional heat, that's additional uh, cost, complexity, bugs, vulnerabilities, patching cycles, performance. Uh, it's going to be a general drag. And, you know, when I, when I talk to people who are passionate defenders of human freedom, uh, whose hair has been on fire since 2013, you know, they, they will some, I've been told to my face, uh, Paul, the 1990s called, they want your firewall back. Um, no, they didn't, because uh, if I have an IoT baby monitor pointed at the crib, uh, but it's got a vulnerability, and it is all of a sudden participating in a botnet, I've got to know. I, I have to know that it is now behaving anomalously. That means I have to have a firewall. I have to monitor the traffic and I have to be able to control it. So it's, this is not a 1990s thing that I happen to have kept with me all these years. Um, but anyway, the, uh, the people who see the reaction to QUIC and DOH are either going to say that it's bad hu humanity or bad engineering and that for one or both of those reasons we ought not do it. Um, again, I'm not telling you what might happen. I'm just, <laughs> these are the inevitabilities that have been set in motion. Now, um, let me say, uh, when transport, which has meant TCP for a lot of us, uh, when transport needed to be modified, there were system calls when some server or client running in user mode had to ask the kernel to please connect me to a place or please accept a connection. And that gave the kernel, or perhaps some bit of endpoint detection and response software, uh, an opportunity to decide whether that connection was in our best interests or not. Um, that won't happen now. You, you will not be able to tell in EDR software or in a kernel when a connection is being started up or accepted, uh, which direction, uh, who initiated, where it's going. You'll know the IP address of the far end, and that's it. Um, and that is going to mean that, again, this, this whole thing where we're doing this behavioral business and, and interrupting system calls in order to get some kind of security is lame. Uh, none of us would choose it if we had other choices. It, we don't have other choices, so we do this, and now this choice is being taken from us. Um, and you're going to need to be ready for uh, malware to exercise its rights. Um, now, we do get one silver lining there. Uh, to the extent that you are going to uh, interrupt this in some way, like causing UDP to fail so it, you know, it falls back to TCP, causing TLS 1.3 to fail so it would fall back to TLS 1.2, um, then you look like a, a malware reverse engineer. And so a lot of malware is evasive, and if it thinks that you're watching it, if, the, if it thinks it's running in a VM on some researcher's desk, it will not behave badly. 
because it doesn't want to be uh, researched. And so you, as a site security administrator, doing something to interrupt this new, completely, uh, you know, perfect entropy environment where you can't see anything, you're going to look like a, a reverse engineer. So a lot of malware will just decide not to behave badly on your network because it can't tell the difference between a uh, site security administrator and a malware engineer. So uh, one small cool thing that we get out of this. So um, I made these slides before I had competed, completed my, uh, my corporate training about getting permission uh, before using images. So uh, my apologies to uh, the copyright holder, but this is pub pretty public information. This was a famous episode of a famous TV series from the 60s where a computer uh, took over the ship and wanted to uh, make sure that nothing could stop it. And so power was the thing it just had to have. Um, this is so predictive of what we're doing now um, that I just, I had to use it. So, um, looks like I have five minutes according to this clock down there. Um, and I am hoping we get a little bit of discussion going on this. Hey, man. Hey, Paul, how you doing? Now, great talk. Really appreciate you coming out and sharing this with us. I, um, I am preferring to remain anonymous for privacy reasons. Um, it seems like in the early days, we have uh, an internet that grows and grows and grows, and we're all celebrating. We have all these endpoints we can connect to. It seems like we're at the point now where maybe we don't need to have two billion endpoints to be able to access my PC or your baby monitor. So I wonder if maybe the right approach is, as you're saying, uh, develop better and more automated whitelisting types of systems. So if me, for my own use, I can say, these are the destinations that this good housekeeping seal of approval uh, says are reasonable and good sites to go to. That is something we might think of if we had choices. Um, and I think we should probably pretend that we have choices and actually follow that. Uh, I would like it to be that your average home gateway, you know, DSL modem, whatever it is, um, negotiates with the endpoints and says, these are the conditions under which you may leave my house. Uh, and the endpoint will say, I don't like those conditions, so I'm just not going to work. And you'll have to return me to the store or something. Uh, but I w rather than what we do now, where we try to do things to the endpoint without the endpoint knowing, and now the endpoint is trying to evade that. You know, the, if, if the owner of your network won't give you permission to speak off net, then you should either not speak off net or, or something. But that's going to take a lot of work. Uh, it's going to have to be go through the IETF, which is going to wonder why are we doing this, because it means that, let's say, an authoritarian country might just say, you know, unless you allow me to decrypt everything you said, you can't get out of here. Uh, why should we give dictators that, that type of control? Well, that's a discussion in and of itself, and I'll be at the bar later. Yes, sir. Hi, Lee Howard from IPv4.global by Hilco Stream Bank, uh, which is also a heck of an identity. Um, uh, thank you also, um, because I was also at the IETF at the time saying, let's not do this. This seems like a bad idea. There are, there are cases here where we're weakening our security by ensuring our privacy. Um, you described that there may be some things that, that more predictably um, we could expect firewall security site administrators to do in response. Um, there may be opportunities for groups like this to get together around a, a lunch table and come up with some best practice documents or, or practice documents at least saying, here's what you need to do if you are in charge of securing a network. Um, do you think that efforts like that might be able to result in a feedback loop to the IETF or are they just a lost cause? I do. And, you know, I don't want to seem hopeful, but <laughs> um, the, yeah, my decades of work in this field have taught me that uh, road builders always win against wall builders. And so if we create some way to do this more securely, and we've got multiple interoperable implementations, open source, yada, yada, um, it'll catch on, right? Because there is going to be a huge need for this. Uh, most people have no idea that it's coming. 
most people who have a next-gen firewall are saying, okay, I solved my problem. They don't have a plan for when TLS 1.3 puts that firewall out of business. But they will find out. They will, this is going to catch the world by surprise, and then everybody's going to be up in arms. And they're going to be looking for solutions. And I think that we could absolutely build one. Now, I want to say, um, before the, the time runs out, Quick is a huge engineering effort and it allows the congestion control that we've been doing in TCP to be done in user mode. And that's bad in one way because it used to be you could upgrade your, uh, your congestion control just by updating the operating system and your apps didn't need to know about it. Now the app has to link against a later version of the library and maybe they won't all do it and so it's going to be a little worse but it's going to allow for much more rapid innovation in things like congestion control. And so that will give us a lot more ability to fix, let's say, the buffer bloat problem. And, um, you know, Quick is a good protocol from an engineering standpoint. And I have only respect for the people who have uh, put, their, put their shoulders to it. It's just the uh, societal impact that worries me. Yes, sir. Hi, um, my name is David Tuber uh, from Cloudflare. Um, the great talk, really liked it. Um, one question, uh, with all the privacy stuff that's coming out of these protocols, if most of the users who are using these protocols are actually just sending their data to Google and Facebook and anybody who will just take their data and then resell it, what is the value of having this privacy stuff at all if you know, we're just kind of giving up our data freely for consumption? You seem to have read Shoshana Zubkoff's book about surveillance capitalism. Um, uh, let me say that uh, that is what I meant when I asked you all to look for a Cat5 jack on the back of your head because we're, we're letting the makers of our servers and our clients decide uh, what will happen to our information and uh, we're saying that it's okay that we have no idea what it is. But let me answer your question a little more directly. There's a famous lawsuit, famous in the DNS field anyway, where um, Comcast sued Google over DNS over HTTPS, and in their lawsuit, they said the thing that nobody is ever allowed to say, but the lawyers didn't know that this is something you'd ever say, so they said it. They said, Google and Com Comcast are in the advertising business. We both need to monitor DNS traffic, and by using DOH, Google is acting in an anti-competitive way. They're saying that they get to see our users' DNS traffic, but we, Comcast, do not shocking that they said the thing you never say out loud but that is the real world and i'm not saying google was doing any of this for that reason uh, but i will say that uh, when only endpoints can see what's going on the only endpoints will decide uh, who gets to see it and that's to me interesting last question hey paul um Joe Provo, Google, Aaron AC, speaking for myself. Uh, did I hear a glimmer of hope um, when you were talking about endpoint signaling? Does that mean you think MUD is the right way to go for these baby monitors and so forth to signal what they are desiring to do? Um, it's an imposed choice, and uh, it's one you would only make if you are where we are now. Um, so I don't want to make it sound attractive in any other set sense, but in context, yes. Uh, the, the old firewall traversal working group that tried to do this back in the 90s um, was ahead of its time. And now that we have enough transistors and enough watts of power, uh, we need to re-explore that. But I got to tell you that the IoT makers are in a terrible economic condition. They, you know, your average IoT device will never make money from its own sales. Um, it's only because it gets to put a microphone in your house and, and listen to what you say and somehow monetize the result that that company will ever make money from you buying that device. So if we tell them, yeah, that's off the table. We're going to make your device negotiate with my secure exit gateway and it's only going to let you do what the homeowner thinks you should be doing. Those companies are going to fight it tooth and nail. And that's, that's our show. Thank you very much.